Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another. We have so many, so many of these live streams recorded on YouTube at this point. I forgot how many. It's over 150 of them already. Wow. I cannot believe that I lasted that long. But anyway, welcome back. Um, just yesterday uh, and again today, I got a request to talk about monitor calibration. And I thought I had already covered that, but apparently... Maybe it just went over people's heads because they're, they get involved with ICC profiles and driver settings and that type of thing. But how do we get to the point where we can almost, and I always stress that because there's no way you can get a 100% match what you're seeing, but you need to at least be able to rely that the images, your images, the ones you shot or downloaded and you're viewing them on your monitor, are they being displayed correctly? Because that's what's going to then prompt you or make you want to either edit them, maybe correct what you see, maybe a little bit off. But what if the monitor is being displaying your images wrongly to begin with? So you get this false impression of what the image looks like. And it really doesn't look that bad. It's just your monitor doing that, sneaking that weird view. And then you try to correct that weird 
view maybe it's just too bright too saturated maybe it's a little bit too yellowish i just started my computer rebooted it from you know resting all week without any reboots and it loads the basic so-called profile for the monitor and compared to the one that i created with my i1 pro 2 from x right it's very yellow the 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 basic setting is very yellow so that would then prompt me to cool down my images and really then i'm over cooling them down i am making them way too much on the blue realm instead of the way that they were probably correct to begin with you see what i mean so uh had it not been loaded in other words the the calibration that i have installed on my computer does not load immediately first it loads the basic uh, monitor calibration out of the box and then it loads mine on top of it you could see immediately the change uh all of a sudden everything is neutral well so we're going to talk about that because i want to make sure that people understand the link between the relationship between what the monitor is displaying and what will cost you then to edit and really the printer assuming the printer is correctly calibrated at the factory which you know you you got to take that i guess with a grain of salt it's a it's a good enough out of the box um, you, you have to use the right settings you have to use a brand made for that printer in other words when you see those those names of all of those media types they have been calibrated for your printer it exists inside the printer those calibrations and also on your driver and so when you are printing on an epson so-and-so paper or a canon so-and-so paper and you're telling it either to print with icc icm mode sorry or letting the application control color and then you just assign that custom made icc profile that the factory made for you for that particular paper and then you disable color management not icm this time but none so now your application is controlling color through the icc profile and the printer is not controlling color you open that standard image you print it you should get a near perfect result as good as the printer can produce assuming you're using um, relative colorimetric intent mode the the so-called um and and then um i think it's uh black point compensation turned on because you want to open up the last from say zero to ten values on the on the black to white ramp so that will expand otherwise you're going to get some blockages on your last say eight uh shades um so once you set that up so you're going to load say your icc profile tell the, tell the application control color turn off color management in the driver and make sure you have relative colorimetric chosen and black point compensation you print it you should get a near perfect result we're going to show you what that looks like in a minute the other option is to again load a canon paper on a canon printer epson paper on an epson printer and then tell the driver to use icm mode and that will automatically link it to the icc profile so it's doing it sort of automatically for you and you won't have to worry so you tell the application you're going to let the driver control color this time make sure that your rendering intent is also set at relative color metric and black black point compensations turned on if you use q image it's pretty much automatically set for you so you then create you open it let me backtrack you open the image and you print it and then you look at it it's going to be near perfect okay let me leave you hanging at that point let's say hello to those of you who have joined us here and then we'll immediately jump into that subject because I'm going to show you not how to calibrate it, but what to choose during your calibration. Because depending on the spectrophotometer you own, it will be a different type of software. So we're going to use X-Rite software for the i1 Pro 2. I cannot connect my calibrator right now because I have too many other things hooked up to my USB. And it, it just simply, there's no room for it. I, I cannot disconnect other things that i am currently using so maybe i will do a video dedicated just for that 
and not, you know, during uh, a live stream. I just cannot do it. So anyway, let's say hi to our first arrival here. Guess who it is? Of course, Nigel Waters. And he was here. 7.20 a.m. my time. Wow. I think that's a record, my friend. That is indeed a record. Martin Van Gogh is here from the Netherlands. Epson SCP 900, OEM inks, Ilford paper, Ilford papers brand, ICCs as well. Only, only monochrome. QMH Ultimate Lifetime for your printing, his printing. Harold Goldberg is here from Sunny and Warm Richmond, Virginia. It is like 71. It's supposed to reach almost 80 this afternoon. Bright sun outside, gorgeous day. A little bit windy this morning, but not too bad. Uh, Pro 100 with all the trimmings. Kevin Berniarski is here from Ellsworth, Wisconsin. Pro 300 XP 15,000. Ecotank 8550 and edits in Photoshop. And I assume you print out of Photoshop as well. Emmanuel here from Normandy, France. Ecotank 8550, Color Monkey, Data Color Spider Print. Q Image 1. Henry Stoffel, Medford, Mass. Epsom P800, OEM Inks, QMH Ultimate. Everybody hit the like button. Yes, please do so. Please do so while you are here. Harold Davies, La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, Pro 1000, 2100, and a PCSE, QMH, and 76 degrees today. Wow, you're warmer than we are right now. Um, I just I just downloaded your last few photos. We're going to be printing those at the end, near the end, that is. Gordon Cato is here, or Cato, from, from Missouri. Uh, Canon Pro 100 PC inks, Canon TS, TC20 TC, TC ink owl inks, Epson Ecotank 8550 OEM inks, Canon IPF 760 with ink owl inks. And Neil Gibb from Toronto, Canada, brand new used P7000. Wow, that's that's pretty pretty fancy. I think I saw one of those. Where were we? Where were we the other day? Uh oh, at CVS, the drugstore. They had a big P7000 uh for you to print gigantic prints on. Um I guess they just allow I, I don't know whether they allow me to go there and do that. I think someone else has to operate it for us. But anyway, welcome everybody. Nice to have everyone back here. So let's go back to what we were discussing. So I am looking at myself. Am I being displayed correctly? Well, I don't know. I cannot see my skin tones. I assume I sort of look correct. Hang on. We got one more entry here. Janet, D Janet Diaz de Valentin. Hi, Jose. Long time, my friend. Sitting here resting from a large Home Depot order. Lots of wood. Woods that had to be carried to backyard. I'm extending my deck. And yes, all by myself. Where well, you're a hell of a woman then. Hey, all righty. Good luck with that project. Kevin says, can you tell me again where you find Harold? Harold's that you download uh, by email only. Um, privately. Uh, that's not publicly. I, at least I, I don't think it is. So Harold's right here. He can answer that. He emails me and sends me the photographs. All righty. So we're talking about getting to the point where you trust what you're viewing. And that way, then it makes sense to do any kind of edits. I may open an image and say, this requires zero editing. Well, the reason I say that is because when I'm looking at it, it looks correct to me. It looks the way I would like it to be, you know, printed on paper. So I, I will not perform any edits. But most of the time, you know, that's not the case. We're going to adjust this and that. And so in order to do that and have it make sense, in other words, have that printer behind me reproduce what I just did to that image, I have to be viewing that image truthfully. Okay, It has to be displayed correctly. And the only way to do that is via monitor calibration. Okay. And what does that entail? Well, you have RGB 
emitting diodes. And so are they emitting the right intensity? Are they emitting from, say, if I turn it all the way down, if I turn red all the way down to the point where there's no light, that would be black. And then I increase, that would be step one, the darkest red you could imagine, and so on linearly. If it is not linear, then it's not correctly calibrated. In other words, if it is, say, increasing in density, this amount, this amount, this amount, this amount, and then all of a sudden, a higher amount per click, per position from 0 to 255, then that's not linear. So the only way to get a linearly neutral, in other words, what that I mean, by that I mean that if you go, say, from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 254, 255 is as bright as it can go. Every increment was exactly the same amount, okay? And that has to be for your blue, your green, and your red. That's it. Then the overall intensity has to be adjusted. Now, how about the white point? The white point is really, am I going to make this bluish? When you buy a monitor or even a TV and you take it home, is going to be oversaturated, over bright, and over contrasty, and maybe toward the blue realm. I would never use that TV for editing my photographs. If I could hook it up to my computer, it would not be set correctly for editing photographs. It's wonderful for movies. That's why some of these TVs, they have different modes that you can actually assign. They have been pre-calibrated to certain modes, certain viewing modes. And sometimes uh, I have one that says cinematic. Well, to me, it's just reduce the contrast a little bit, decrease the dynamic range so I, I see, you know, from the blackest to the whitest and possibly a little bit reduced. So that way I get whatever the original dynamic range of that movie was, it's always going to be there. It's go always going to be within the limitations of that television screen. Let me, I'm getting raw here. Hang on one sec. Mally Hudson Photography, thanks for the info last week. I have spoken to Martin at Octo Inkjet. He's going to sort me out with the inks for the Canon Pro 1000. Yeah, Martin's a wonderful guy. Uh, I've known him for years. I mean, not personally, you know, on the phone talking, but I've been acquainted with him for years. Um, yeah, great guy. And also, you guys that have Epson printers that have the ability to have, say, the waste ink collection system diverted to the outside, he can fix you up with that. He's got something called a printer potty. Basically, it's a like a like a scientific lab flask made out of plastic. It's like a culture flask. And he can then feed that ink to that flask, collect it there, and then you get rid of it. And also the way to reset your counters back to zero. He can sell you those those keys so that you can use the WIC tool, the W-I-C tool. That way those printers never really die because their waste ink pads are declared full. A, a Canon printer will be declared full, and that's the end of that printer, unless a, a, a service center is willing to replace those pads for you, clean it, reinstall the complete printer back into that chassis, and, and reset those counters. Yeah, anyway, off the subject, but he's a great guy. He will fix you up with anything you need. All righty. George Gab, West Texas, 81 degrees down there. Pro 10, Ink Owl, Ink Set, 8550, Topaz Sharpen, A, AI on. All right, so let's, oh boy, they just, uh, newest OM1 photo raw and new denoise built in looking very interesting. I haven't dealt with that one yet. So let's continue on. <clears throat> so the idea, of course, is this. Let's let's turn this light on. I'm going to show you. I showed you this last week, I believe. Um, you need to you need to set your not set, but find out what your cap the capabilities of your printers, if you have multiples, are. 
And the way you test that is with a control image. So <clears throat> that control image is never, never, you know, uh, edited or changed in any way, shape, or form. So you're going to open it and you're going to print it, but you have to print it correctly. So the idea is to use a paper dedicated for that printer, the correct ICC profile for it, because then you tell the driver either to use ICM, choose that same paper again, and it's going to link you, link you to that profile. And you're going to get the correct rendition. You're going to get what that printer can produce. And since the image is never going to be altered in any way, it's going to print what it receives. And you get this. So you get a perfectly neutral, <clears throat> perfectly printed print of that standard image. But now as you just printed it, you're going to then compare it to what your screen is producing. Does that match? <clears throat> is the screen a little bit yellowish? Does this look a little bit yellowish? Does this look a little bit bluish? Does it look a little bit greenish? Whatever. Whatever the 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 off color condition of what you're seeing might be, that immediately tells you your screen is not properly calibrated. Simple. You're not gonna, you know, calibrate the screen and take its word for it. This is how you test it. <clears throat> this is how you test it. Clocks are tested. Against what? Our number one source, the atomic clock. That's what we set everything by in the world, okay? So as far as clocks. So with this, is a standard image. It was produced by the International Color Consortium. That's where the ICC term comes from. And then you download it, you open it, and you print it using the correct color management. And you get this. So then you have to match this to that. And the way to do that, at least I'm going to walk you through real quick the way that I go about calibrating my monitor, at least choosing the correct settings for this particular monitor, monitor this very dark viewing conditions, which I recommend, I actually recommend you use. And so right now the room is lightly bright because I, uh, lightly brightly lit because I have three lights at the same time going on, let me turn this one off. It's giving me a headache. And so here's what you do. You're going to adjust. Once you once you linearize your RGB output from 0 to 255, linear. Not like this, but linear. That means that RG and B are producing the perfect amount of light per step. Okay? And now you want to also adjust your white point. And for printing, for editing, D55. We'll cover this when I jump into the driver, into the uh, software, I mean. And so also the brightness. Monitors come pre-calibrated for, again, just like TVs, for the wrong uh, use, not photo printing, for just normal sitting in your in your you know room or your office and you see a bright and bluish bluish look looks bright to us our eyes and our brain sees it as a super bright that's why they that's why huh, that's why they add OBAs to paper optical brightening agents they fluoresce and they fluoresce bluish which means that paper base looks super white you ever seen a t-shirt under blue light is just brightly glowing. So that's why they calibrate at the factory toward the blue side of the spectrum. And that way, when you open up your, your screen, you connect it to your computer, everything looks fabulous until you try to edit. Not so good at that point. All right, so let me jump over to the screen. So here is, as you, as you can see, um, my my i1 pro 2 is not even recognized because it's simply not plugged in so in this software it's very advanced it's very very uh way up there uh you might be using something from say calibrite uh which is the company that bought out the prosumer and consumer level equipment from x-ray x-ray not only 
now only deals with professional level stuff. So they have sold out everything else to Calibrate. You may use um, Spider, uh, Spider uh, Calibrators, such as this one from the company Data Color. And yeah, so those are you basically your choices at this point. So you're going to open up your software and you're going to get some choices. So what do you what do you want to calibrate? So display profiling. So this is your display. We have projector profiling. You can profile a projector, a digital projector, so that it matches what, say, your laptop has on the screen. So the projected image will match that on the screen. And quite often when I sit at a meeting or, you know, a, a discussion when I was working in labs, um, yeah, nothing ever matched, especially when we were showing photomicrographs, you know, microscope photography slides, nothing ever matched in color. And color was important, but printer profiling. So this is what we use to calibrate our printer with. In other words, we're going to be creating a ICC profile. This is new. This is a scanner profiling. So I have a scanner right here, and I could actually profile it so that I can then count on what I am scanning being reproduced correctly. So when I see it on the screen, that image of that photograph, that piece of art, whatever, is correct. It's actually calibrated. So those are extra things. So most of the time, we're just concerned with this one and this one. So let's jump over. This is the one that they wanted me to cover a little bit on. And let me just give you a, a warning. I am not, I am not an expert when it comes to monitors. I just know how to calibrate them properly. So the way that I have found I can get my monitor as close as I possibly can to display to me as close a perfect rendition of the image that I am opening. In other words, those values, someone knows what those values are. My monitor does not. My monitor simply receives the data and attempts to recreate those colors by differing amounts of R, G, and B emitting. Okay? So that's how it works. Low emittance, darker colors. High higher colors and so but again it has to be linear so let's go ahead and click on here and this is what we get immediately so i'm going to be looking over here while i am just describing what we are doing here so god this my monitor sucks i swear so this is for displaying for calibrating your display and i have two of them we would never be calibrating this cheapo thing on the right i don't i don't really uh, care about that. We're going to calibrate the HP. So let me pop it over there again. I accidentally moved it. So we calibrate the HP. Of course, that's why I moved it over here. And we're going to be doing white point calibration. So the white point calibration basically sets that, that color balance. In other words, is everything going to look neutral or is it going to look toward bluish? Or is it going to look toward the warm side? So simply put, what we do, we're just going to go ahead and, and, and choose. Um, let me see. Where is D65? So D65 is the standard for calibrating a monitor. That is the white point. Don't get confused with calibration for your ICC profile. Okay, That is D50. Confusing? Yes, it is. Don't worry about it. Take my word for it. D65 for your monitor and D50 for your for your um, ICC profiles. Luminance. Now, look at how low I am here in the luminance. Normally, if I choose what normally they want you to calibrate at, something around 250, that's okay if you're going to be in an office that's completely lit with banks of fluorescent lights on the ceiling uh very bright no if you do that if you work in such an environment you will never be able to determine what black is on your image black will always look lit because you're seeing the actual screen color sure it's not emitting anything 
but it still looks brighter than black, okay? So you want to work on a dark environment, and when you do that, then that ridiculously high CDM2 rating or candela rating will be just way too bright. So what you need to do is for my situation, I am using either 80 or if I go to, I can't see this. I had a custom setting here. Anyway, I had a set to what I normally do is 70. So 70 for me is absolutely perfect. Now, gamma, 220, okay? In the old days of the previous generations of Apple or Mac computers and screens, it was 1.8. Right now it's 2.20. Everybody's using 2.20, so do not mess with that, okay? Leave it alone. Let me come over here a minute so I can see what I'm doing here. Okay, now I can see. So I set this to custom down here. It says custom. You have choices. Custom allows me to then adjust this. If I so wish, I, I don't know why I would want to do that. And then it allows me to set my my gamma, my, not my gamma, but my uh, illumination custom, and then I can bring it down to 70. You can go all the way down to like 40. That's way too dark. 40 would be in literally a room with zero lights. I have seen that type of environment before uh, at a video editing facility. And again, you couldn't you, you you were tripping over things as you were walking through this uh, studio, this editing studio. So that's way too dark. But if you go to that that type of environment, then you have to lower your luminance even more. So that brings it to the point where it's now displaying your RGB linearly from zero all the way to two fifty five. It is set at the correct white point, which is D sixty five, and then your luminance. You have to play with that. So. In your editing environment, you look at your standard image, which now look pretty much what you get on paper after you calibrate this way. And if it looks too bright, then you have to recalibrate and just simply lower the luminance manually by choosing the custom. Um, your software, depending on the professional level of your spectrophotometer is, or your, your colorimeter, if you're just using a colorimeter just for your monitor um, may not allow you to go below 80. So yeah, you have to you have to be aware of what the cap the limitations of your your calibrator is. So you want to bring it down to the point where you don't have to um, say, for instance, if your images look too bright and you tend to knock down the brightness, you could, they're going to print dark. That's what happens. They're going to end up printing dark because you made them dark by reducing the luminance the of the image itself it was correct to begin with but now it looks correct on your too bright monitor and now it's going to print too dark that's a simple the the simplest answer to that that problem that everybody everybody experiences when they begin to print It's it's one of the most mind-boggling, and I have heard, which makes me, what? Oh, I have one hair left. No, oh, let's pull that out. Pull that out. I pull out my last hairs when I see professionals on YouTube telling you to create an adjustment layer and add one stop. Are you out of your mind? You are then re. Reducing the intensity of the, the image so it looks correct on your monitor. Now it's really physically too dark. And now you're adding a layer on top of that that's going to expand it again to a higher luminance. No, folks, that, that, that's not gonna that's not gonna give you the same thing. That's not going to provide you with the same quality or the same condition. Had you had it calibrated properly the image brightness whatever that brightness is will be displayed correctly in your monitor and then you can rely on that 
and then make the decision to brighten or lessen the brightness or leave it alone. If it looks perfect, you just don't touch it and it will print correctly. Like that, okay? It's, there you go. Now you can see it. I got some light landing on it. You have to have it illuminated nicely. There you go. So that's that's why you have to do this, do this little test. And so that way you know, oh, my printer is producing the correct rendition of the control. Okay? So the control is like, for example, oh, you know, I have a little bit of a fever. Let me take my temperature. And you shoot me with one of those new guns that they have now. And it says 101. But that gun is not calibrated properly. It's it's really two degrees too hot. You see, off. So it's going to then give me the appearance of having a fever when really I do not. So then you're going to lower my temperature. Give me some medications to lower my temperature. And what's a term for uh, being too cold and you pass out? Yeah, that's what it's going to drop me to 96. <laughs> 0.8 and then I'm going to pass out. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. That's it for now. <laughs> Enough about that. So just make sure that what you print, when you print that standard image, you need to have your monitor match that. Okay. Don't start off with the monitor because you really don't know what you're looking at. Your eyes and your brain will adjust and it will fool you. You need to print that standard image and then match that result, which will be about as perfect as you can get, if you do it correctly, to this. Now this is displaying colors correctly. You open up your, your unknown image. You don't know what the values are until you do what? Until you see it on your monitor. And then you hope that it's being displayed correctly. So that if I choose to make adjustments, they really mean something, okay? That is a key, the key to all of this. Once you nail that, you're you're done. It's, it becomes boring almost to print. It, do, it really does. All right, my glasses are dirty. I don't know how I keep smudging my glasses. Man. Okie dokie. We have a few more people here that just joined us. We're up to 39. I think I saw 40 something just a couple of seconds ago. Daniel Vulcos from Montana, Canon Pro 100 with all the goodies. Thanks, Jose. Will Carson, that sounds so Western, like out of a Western movie. Um, hello, Jose from Southern California on a rainy day. Is there an OEM source of ink? For the Pro 300, yeah, Canon. <laughs> yeah, they don't have they don't have um, like bottles of ink you can buy. Okay, I am not using the Pro 10, but I may replace it. Yeah, uh, you just OEM. Yeah, that just means you buy cartridges. Sorry, uh, there's there's no there's no really a, a source of uh, say for instance like bottles unless. Unless, say, for instance, let's just assume that something like a Pro 2000 that you can buy big cartridges for, are the, is the magenta a match for the Pro 300 magenta? Is the yellow a match for the Pro 300 yellow? Like so. And then you can just buy um, bigger cartridges. It'll just be a bit less per milliliter. Um, you'd have to extract the ink from those big carts. And assume that it is the same color match, which probably it is not. But now it is Pro 300 is considered an IPF printer, so maybe they did match it to the larger um, units. And so, if that's the case, then yeah, you could buy. You know, I have a link on my. That's this is how Precision Colors buys OEM ink for the Pro 1000. They buy 700 ml cartridges. I have a provider that sells them for two twenty-five, dollars uh, including shipping to the U.S. Uh, for 700 ml. So you buy these cartridges, extract the ink as needed, 
and you load up the smaller units with it. And so that way you're printing as, as good an ink as you can possibly get, but less per ml. Harold Davies says, the website that sells our images is being updated. We expect it to be up again in 60 days. All right. George says, exporting a 800 patch TIFF file from an i1 profile and then printing it via RIP CMYK TDF, large format printer, then scanning it with the i1 Pro 2. Would this create a valid ICC profile for me? Possibly. Yeah, possibly. As you were, we're talking different different animal here. That would be like me, for instance, uh, creating a 700, I mean, an 800 patch TIFF file out of uh, i1 Pro software and then printing that on transfer paper and then transferring that to a sheet of aluminum, sublimation aluminum, and then scanning that and then using that ICC profile. Sure, it's technically possible. Uh, you're just dealing with 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 direct to film. It's not like sublimation where you have so many other variables. But yeah, that should work. That should work. Uh, with with sublimation, it's a little bit more. You're relying on you know other variables such as the transfer pressure on the heat press, the temperature. Five degrees will make a whole you know change on your output uh, and so forth. Time uh, that you press, uh, in other words. And yeah, but yeah, this should work if you're doing direct to uh, film printing. I don't know about, do you have to use CMYK? Can you just print that? In other words, printed RGB, let the driver, the driver will convert it to CMYK. I don't think you have to convert the, the file to CMYK to print it. Neil Gibbs says, I'm killing myself laughing. Are you out of your mind? Last hair, so-called bro, create an adjustment layer. So true, so awful. Yeah. And these were, these were some really big, in the early days of YouTube, yeah, big people claiming this. When all they had to do, see, I never, I can, I can easily say that without any issues. I have never had to adjust my image, increase its density so that it prints correctly. No. What I see is what I get when I print it. It all has to do with the intensity of your room, and then you lower the intensity of your screen. And you cannot just lower it manually. You have to do it through a, a calibration software. And, a, and a, a colorimeter if you're just doing the screen. Because if you just reduce it, it's not going to keep the linearity of your RGB outputs. It's just not going to. All right, Ron Case says, hello, Ecotank 8550 and QImage. I cannot stay. I just wanted to say hello, and I appreciate this live stream every Sunday. I will catch up on replay later. Well, no problem, my friend. Make sure that you do come back and watch this craziness when when you have time thank you again for coming on board and visiting all right so oh boy i gotta i gotta look this up first so that i can i can refer to it you know what okay let's see i'm trying to make up my mind whether i really have to Someone from Toronto is looking for someone from Toronto to help me set up and train me with my Canon Pro 1000. It's a paid gig. Please let me know if you can help me out. So uh, does he realize that Precision Colors Mike Lee lives there? Hmm, maybe I'll tell him. No, nah, I'll do that later. <laughs> That's that just caught me. This is brand new. Okay, so this is it right here. 
Let me pop this over there. Ink detection systems of the Pro 1000, the 2200, and now 2600, all of those printers, all to the biggest one they have, which is a 6600 or whatever it is now. So they detect ink in the most ingenious way you could ever think of. And as, as exact as the system is, because everyone else is guessing. Everyone else is really guessing how much ink has passed through the printhead, how many, how many droplets of ink have been generated and spit out of the printhead. But the Pro 1000 and others does it actually pretty scientifically and exact. The others, no, they just assume that so many droplets of ink were generated. Therefore, you must have used this amount of ink. Um, no, not the case. And also not very exact. So I've explained this in the past. You have three sensors in each compartment. There are 12 compartments. Where are they located? Beyond the installation of the cartridges. So beyond that, there is a valve. That valve either opens or remains shut. When the valve is open, ink can then enter. Enter what? That internal compartment. And those are actually vented to the atmosphere. So if you did not have a valve controlling ink flow or the entering of ink into that compartment, it would just overflow. It would empty the cartridge and you would have ink all over your table and you would cuss me out forever, you know, uh, suggesting you buy Pro 1000. So the way that it prevents that from happening is like such. And I saw the diagram rather, yeah, it was a cheesy little diagram on the uh, service manual for that printer that displays what's happening. So think of it as a compartment and you have three sensors. One is near the bottom and one of them's about, you know, maybe a third from the bottom. And then there's one that's right on top, a little higher than that. And you reach that vent, that venting system that connects that internal space to the atmospheric um, surrounding condition. So you have a vent. It would be like a cart without a plug. This would be a vent. So when that, that compartment is empty, as in when you first set up the printer, it, of course, automatically, that valve is open. You install cartridges, and then you close the lid of your printer, and the printer begins to charge those compartments. It fills them up. As it's filling them up, ink is flowing beyond that and filling up the dampers in your printhead and, of course, being flushed out of the printhead. This is all a mechanical process taking place at that point. It's not a passive process. That begins when you start to print, actually print. So you now end up, your printer set up, you did all your tests, you did your nozzle check, you did your internal calibration, now you're printing. So let's just talk about, say, Chroma Optimizer this puppy right here. So you begin to print on glossy paper and it's going to use Chroma Optimizer. So that internal compartment, let's just pick uh, five ml of ink. It holds five ml of ink, fine. Uh, I don't know what it really is. They don't tell you this. So let's just say five ml of ink. And when that compartment is full, it triggers a sensor that is near the top, but underneath, that level where the venting is, okay? When that sensor is triggered, that valve shuts down behind it. And so no more chroma optimizer from my cartridge can flow into the compartment. So the compartment has reached its full level, and now I start printing. So I begin to print, and I use 1 ml, okay? Fine. I print another one. I use another ml. 
Okay, fine. So let's just say for the sake of argument that at the 3 ml level, in other words, 3 ml from the top, there's another sensor. When, as long as that sensor is submerged under the chrome optimizer, it's fine, it's happy. The minute that sensor is above and touching air, it sends a signal. Where? To that valve. That valve then opens up, more chrome optimizer trickles, optimizer trickles in, that compartment begins to fill up. One, two, three. Ah, the upper sensor gets submerged under chrome optimizer and it shuts the valve down. So this cycle, this replenishing cycle takes place over and over and over. Every time one of those cycles is completed, it knows it used 3 ml of chrome optimizer or any other color ink. They're all the same. So it uses 3 ml. Every cycle, it uses 3 ml. It knows this started off with 80. You see, so it starts to count down. Depending on how many cycles took place, it knows exactly how much ink is left. When this reaches about, say, the point where there's like 22, 23, I don't even know exactly what it is, ML left, it triggers a low warning. That low warning is a yellow exclamation mark. You will see it on your driver. You will see it on your screen, on your printer. So now it knows that I have exactly this much ink left. But it's still not going to rely on the every time it recycle every time it refills that compartment, it uses 3 ml. So it should be easy math. No, it, it continues to do that, it continues to count. But at one point, if there's 3 ml left and it needs 3 ml to go from the second sensor to the upper sensor, fine, it'll do that. The valve closes down, you print, 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 you use up 3 ml, that second sensor is triggered. It opens up the valve and there's no ink. There was no, there's no ink. It used up the last three. But what if it just used up one? What if there was, say, five ml? I used up three and now there's two ml left in the cartridge. Well, it will allow those two ml to flow, but that's not enough to reach the upper sensor. The valve stays open and it says, Give me some chroma optimizer. Well, there's no chroma optimizer. Well, it doesn't decide that the tank is empty at this point. It allows you to print. And say you were 2 ml above that trigger point, and you drop down, and it triggered it, and the last 2 ml came in, filled it, but not to the top. So it still needs one more, but it doesn't have it. It allows you to print. It will continue beyond that point, okay? And then beyond that point as well, beyond the second sensor, you still have ink in that compartment. So it reaches the third sensor, and that's the one that declares the chip as empty. Printer stops at that point. So how to defeat this? If you let it go empty, you could simply, unless you did this beforehand, you could have pre-drilled it and just kept it full or above, say, 50%. Remember, it's relying, it's relying on that third sensor being triggered once it reaches low. In other words, once, once it has used so many refill cycles at 3 ml each, and it reaches a point where, say, let's just say 20 is the low mark. So I used up 60. Okay? It did, what is it, 20 cycles of 3. Is that right? No. Yeah. 20 cycles of 3. 3 times 3. Yeah, 60. And so then it knows I am low. I have 20 more ml left. I know exactly when to trigger that red X, but I'm going to wait for that third sensor to make sure that I get this correct. That's the printer talking to itself. And so it continues printing, but the ink never runs out of the cartridge. It used up the last, what should have been the last 20, 
and there's still ink in the cartridge. So every time it does that, the cart the compartment fills up to the top and triggers that 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 sh shutting the valve sensor. Oh crap! What's going on here? The printer is going nuts, but it allows you to continue printing. At some point, it just says, "Listen, listen, dude, um, you've been using this behind my back. You've been really cheating me for the last a month, and you should have run out of ink long ago. I'm gonna throw a 1753 error at you." Meh. And it does that, and you see it, and the printer stops printing. You're panicking at that point. No, just press the power, the not the power button, the uh, pause button for five seconds, and you will see the words processing across the screen. That's it. Once you see the words processing across the screen, you wait. It will stop, and that chip now is disabled. That can actually happen also if you accidentally let the chip go empty because you didn't really top off that cartridge as you should have been doing. If this is your plan all along, then you should have already pre-drilled the, the, the cartridge, kept it topped off again, you know, above what it would normally be a low point. And yeah, that would have saved you. But say you let it go empty. At that point, stop, take out that cartridge, drill it, add ink, put it back in. It will give you, once you put it back in, it's going to fill that compartment. And it's going to give you an option. It's going to, it's going to say, listen, I, I don't know what the hell you did, but all of a sudden I have ink in my compartment. Do you want to continue printing? It's up to you. It's on you. It's on you, buddy. And you say, yes, and that's it. And I think if that is the case, if you let it go empty, I, I've been told that you may be asked that a couple of times and then eventually it'll be disabled. And I think the error for that, for the other condition where you always refill your cartridge prior to even the low warning first popping up is 1753. This will be a 1752 uh, error. And again, the service manual shows you exactly what to do. All right. So that that's one thing. So now let, let's talk about... Uh, Ink delivery, or not ink delivery, but ink level sensor systems, or the viewport that physically allows you to see ink inside the cartridge through a window. Well, you have to have disabled chips for that. So if the printer says, hey, I know you disabled the chip, but you big dummy, you did not keep it topped off. And now your cartridge is actually empty. Should I just let you, you know, suffer? No, the printer will actually stop when the cartridge is physically empty and there's no more ink to replenish that compartment, even after you disable the chip. So someone said, well, then those sensor systems or the window systems are useless. And I'm thinking, are you out of your mind? Are you going to let your cartridges go empty when well, we are not entirely sure how we're just really this is all speculatory here we assume this is how things operate those instructions in the service manual are not intended for you to be refilling your cartridges and disabling your chips that's not the intention that is just in case something happens this is what you can do they expect you to buy an oem cartridge and replace that one as soon as possible. We, on the other hand, are trying to circumvent the system and come up with a way that we can continue refilling these cartridges. So to say that a sensor system, which lights up a light to show you that that cartridge needs to be topped off, it has reached 20% from empty, so you need to top it off. Or the window system that shows you the physical amount of ink left in there it's simply a way to tell you, hey, maybe you should be topping off this cartridge right about now. Yeah, very irresponsible to say something like that uh, to the world. Yeah. And now I'm going to disclose what happened. So I had this member of my Facebook group. And you know me, I stay out of the way. I allow the members themselves to sort of gov govern what is being said. I just kind of... 
I lurk. And this person was really getting a little bit out of hand and uh, displaying a lot of, uh, um, what's the word, um, really wrong stuff, really uh, not, not really uh, helpful at all. I had to buy, ban him. I had to kick him out. I'm sorry. And I banned him from ever coming back because people that read what other people are spouting like that, and it's completely wrong. And again, I only interfere or come into play when I see the danger that they are going to be causing if I just let them run wild. So he's gone. Um, I hate to say it. This is the first time I've ever doing, done this. And we're nearly at uh, 8,000 and a half members on the Facebook group. So, again, but anyway, when you choose to do this disabling of those chips, there are some responsibilities that you need to accept. And that is now you will be monitoring whether you want to do it yourself. That means that every couple of months, top everything off. Okay. You remove each card, you weigh it, you do the math. You need to be at 112 grams. The total card has to weigh 112 grams, and you add. You just basically figure out the math and add so many ml of ink to each one, pop it back in. That way you always start off with full loads. You will not have any displays anymore. It will all be blank. So you have to be the responsible one and make sure those cartridges never really run out. Do not assume ever. That even though the system will has a safety net, and when that cartridge runs out of ink, it will basically say stop. It will stop the printing. Don't assume that. Okay. If you're relying on a mechanical method, a sensor system, then fine. Use that. That'll warn you way before the danger point. If you rely on the viewport type system, again, that will warn you way before the empty condition hits and there's no way you can pay me to use my printer as a guinea pig no way by the way i missed i missed this offer somebody from virginia had a pro 1000 that we're just going to take over to the uh, local um i think it was the uh, uh thrift store and get rid of it um they have a matte black clogged channel i have a print hit so it was going to be free but he had only given me 24 hours and i didn't see that message until like yesterday and it was from the third of this month so i i missed out on that he was even going to deliver it to my house here in maryland so i got to keep my eyes open there's just too many communications taking place at once uh with me here and and the group and youtube and you name it. It's too bad because, uh, yeah, that would have been nice to have a, a um, spare body, if you will. Cloud says, how do you know if it's okay to refill OEM Canon Pro 300 cartridges without cleaning them first for any potential ink leftovers? Well, how, how are you going to flush out a Pro 300 cartridge when it looks like this? If I can find one. Okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. The, if, if, like I said, if the, say, the Pro 2000 inks, the colors are a match to yellow, magenta, cyan, photo magenta, photo cyan, gray, gray, black, black. If they are a match, Especially Chrome Optimizer will be a match. So you just don't need to. You're adding OEM ink from a large cartridge to a smaller cartridge. These, you know, if you are already dealing with a disabled chip, then you can't really let them go empty. Okay. Uh, although I think you can the first time. And then you disable the chip. And then from that point onward, you just basically uh, load the new ink in. If you're, lead, if you're loading OEM ink into an OEM cartridge, there's no issues at all. If you're, if you're dealing with, say, Precision Colors inks, really there's no issues at all. In fact, none of the other 
USA resellers uh, would have any issues with you having to flush your Pro 10 cartridges. You don't need to. Just add the ink, print, and then on your next refill, yeah, you'll be running 100% that's that new ink. And whether it has a different output quality, you have to deal with that with custom ICC profiles for the papers you are using. But really, there's no, there's not going to be any ink left over. Once you let that cartridge go empty, it is empty. That 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 bag, you see this plate right here? I don't know whether the 300 cartridges have this clear window here. You see that big diaphragm? That is on the side of a pleater bag, and that bag is filled with ink. And it will collapse, completely collapse, when the ink runs out. And so your chip will be declared empty at that point, and you just add ink through the port, directly to the port. In this orientation, take the cap out, and you dribble the ink into the port. Right there, that blue. See, this is cyan. So that, that area there, you just add ink. This just has water in it right now for demonstration purposes. So really, there's no issues with rem remnant ink at all. Okay, there's not going to be any physical reactions. And what happens if I try to print after a refilled cartridge is empty again, since it will be hard to tell when it goes into you never let it go empty. You cannot ever let it run, go empty. Once you disable the chip, you're going to be refilling those cartridges pretty much every couple of weeks, all of them at once. Okay, that's how, that's how it works with the 300. There's no way you can reset the chips, so you disable them. And now you don't know how much ink is left. You would have had to say, I, I have some empty ones that I know are empty. I could weigh them and see what they weigh when they are empty. And that way you know that you never let them go to that weight because they're empty. And yeah, you can't. So once you start refilling after you disable those chips, it's pretty much a constant thing. So you do them all at once. So you always, regardless what level amount of ink was left in those tanks, say every two weeks, you just top everything up. Uh, there's a guy here from Europe that's been doing that for a long time. And uh, he has developed a schedule where he, he knows exactly how much it prints and he knows exactly how often he should top off all the cartridges. Yeah, hard to tell, it's impossible to tell. And the only way to tell it's empty is when it's empty, and you don't want to do that. Michelle Phillips, are you from the Mamas and the Papas? I thought she passed away. Awesome name. Awesome. I used to love that music. Oh, my God. So sad about the way she went. Um, hi, I didn't realize I had to print so often. Went months without printing on a new printer, Canon G7020. I said, that's a tank. After graduation, replace a black printhead, but appears ink isn't running through the hoses. Are you sure you have hoses? Is that a um, do the do the cartridges ride on the printhead or do they just sit still? So it's a G, but maybe that's not a tank type printer. You'll have to you'll have to tell me. No problem, bro. <laughs> so if it's a tank printer, then yes, it has it has ink lines, not hoses, ink lines. Yeah. Well, does it have a single print head or does it have two? You mentioned the black printhead. I assume you just mean the black channel. Yeah. Yeah, it, it'll be just one printer. Um, one printhead, I mean. Um, if it's so bad that you have to replace a printhead, then you'll have to replace a printhead. I don't know how to do that on those types of models myself because I don't own one. Uh, Rick Johnson does, apparently. So he can probably explained uh, whether that is a, 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 v, a user replaceable printhead or not. Okay, that's weird. Okay, I didn't know they still had 
that sort of system. Yeah, you'll have to replace it then. Okay, so yeah, that happens. You have to print. You have to print. It's very sad when that happens, but yeah. Let me see. So you have, yeah. Right. So you have stationary tanks and the ink is fed via ink lines with the printhead. You need to look and see. Uh, hopefully that printer was not very expensive. Um, again, uh, sometimes the only way to go is to just replace it. Yeah. You have to print. There's no other way to put it. Okay, look. So somebody, <laughs> this was a good one. Somebody sent me this the other day and they said when I I need to just load a um, a driver here to show you what they were talking about. I'll just do any driver. It doesn't really matter which one. <clears throat> we'll do the Pro 10 just for fun. Okay, so this is the Pro 10, and he showed me two screen grabs. One he had chosen that. And I'm going like, what are you doing? You know, you really don't have to choose that if you want to print a document. You, It's there, but you really don't have to. So, plain paper. And he was printing on 11 by 17. Okay. So then he went to photo printing. And photo paper, let's just pick, I don't know, luster. And in his situation, he did not see 11 by 17, but as you can see, I can see it on mine. Here's what happened. He had borderless printing on. And so when he went and clicked on it, there is no 11 by 17. 11 by 17 is not a standard borderless paper size. So be careful when you are choosing borderless or not, because that will then disable a ton of different sizes. Let me undo that. And now you can see a bunch more sizes. And you can actually create your own custom size as well. So be aware of that. That's what will cause that issue. When you choose borderless, only a few paper sizes are able to be uh, displayed and basically allow you to print on. And the reason being is that the widths of the paper, remember, everything goes in vertical in portrait mode. So eight and a half, there are some sponges right about that point so that the print head can print beyond the edges and the overspray is caught by the these sponges and they're located along the platen. The platen is where that silvery strip of metal with rollers on it and the paper passes underneath it. That has to have these sponges at sit, situated at very strategic widths. And so not every width paper, like 11, it, it, it just cannot. Eight and a half. What's the next one up? You would think 11 by 14, but 11 by 14 cannot be printed that way. And so uh, the next one is 13. So 13 will have sponges right there to catch that overspray. Weird. And that just had him going crazy trying to figure out what the heck was wrong. Wrong, And all it was was that I noticed immediately, oh, you chose borderless. And I posted that. That was the end of that thread. You see what I mean? So folks, you need to really pay attention if you're going to be helping someone out and they post 
say, a screen grab of their settings, their driver settings, take a close look because it might just be something silly like choosing borderless that will disable many other different sizes that normally are available, especially when printing on just the normal standard mode, okay, which I never use anyway. I print my documents in photo mode. Who cares? It produces just as good a result. Unless I'm printing junk and I want to print it as quickly as possible, then I'll use standard, but that happens hardly ever. Just me from Transylvania, Romania, Romania, uh, Pro 1000 L8150. That is a tank type, a predecessor to the Eco Tanks, by the way. This is uh, when these came out, they were only available in foreign countries and not the United States. I want Studio, Kimmich Ultimate, all the fuzz. All righty. Rick Johnson said on the G620, there is a left and right printer. Okay. I didn't know that. So, but they are fairly cheap, $34 assuming. Yeah, so um, Michelle, look for that and then replace that printhead. And that should bring you back to life. I assume your colors. Uh, how many colors does that model print on? Three? So yellow, magenta, cyan, or is it yellow and magenta and photo magenta and cyan and photo cyan? That would be five. It's probably just, I assume... It's probably just going to be the uh, yellow magenta cyan. So just buy yourself a black printhead for it and replace it. That, sh that should be, you know, bring you back. Oh, you have, okay, so black is usually a K. Or is that blue? So if it's blue, then if, you're, if your color nozzle check is complete, don't worry about it. Just get the black printhead and install it. Install it and then make sure your tank is full and you you should be good to go. Run a cleaning cycle, nozzle check, check the nozzle check to make sure it is. Don't print with, don't print any photos or anything if you know a channel is not printing. This print hit might already be burnt out anyway. So you replace it, nozzle check, nothing yet, cleaning cycle, nozzle check. Don't print anything until you are sure that all of these colors are printing, okay? And you will see that on the actual nozzle check itself. You can try what again? I think if you have done cleaning cycles already and they're not helping, you need a new print hit, okay? And as Rick Johnson said, they're not that expensive. Yeah, replace them both. That'll that'll bring you back to new, new condition. Yeah. Well, they're thermal printheads, and they are known to to do that uh, when you basically ignore them, right? When you were away. You need to clean the printhead or a new one. Buy a new one. Start from fresh. If I was you, that's the way. I, <coughs> if it's cheap enough, that would not be no option for me. That would be a new printhead or printheads. You might as well start from fresh. All right, let's go to the next subject. People wanted to know my evaluation images. What do I have that I have listed on the Facebook group? I said downloadable big file containing all of them and why why do you need all of these i'm going to go through a few of them and show you what the uses are okay yeah at least twice a week okay i just let me let me just grab something for 1000 also check. I do this every day, okay? Every single day, whether I need to or not. The reason to keep everything flowing. I'm not printing big photographs every single day on it. So I do this 
everything is printing. I can't turn that on. It'll be too bright. And uh, this is this is the uh, Chrome Optimizer. There's two bands here that originally were a little bit wet. And so it's gray with a Chrome Optimizer, two bands uh, on top. So, yeah, just make sure you print. I do this daily, okay? If you're not printing daily photos or whatever, print a nozzle check, okay? Just do the nozzle check. That'll be in your maintenance tab of your driver. So that'll that'll keep that flowing. You don't have to necessarily be printing images, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and open. Let's open up. Um, how should we do this? I think we can just use Windows Photo Viewer. That should be enough. We'll start with the first one here, which is... This one. So all of these can be downloaded from my Facebook group. Um, I don't know whether any of the Norton notices North Light images, and a lot of their links don't work anymore for whatever the reason, but I was able to download them prior to this malfunction, and then I have them as a compilation that you can download and get for free. Okay, so what we have here is a dedicated black and white test print monochrome. I don't know why people say black and white because you're only using black ink. Okay, there's only black and grays and you composite other gray tones with color inks, but whatever. You're not using white ink. So the white is the paper base itself. And so what we have here is components that you want to be using to analyze whether your printers can produce a linearly neutral result. Where, depending on the density, you see here from black all the way to paper white, and then again, white all the way to paper black. So you notice there's a transition occurring here. And you want to make sure that the printed version of this, first of all, your monitor has to be displaying this correctly as well. You cannot have any kind of interruption here through that transitional area here. Along this zone right here, that has to be perfectly smooth. There cannot be any banding or any kind of a what we call posterization, which is like a, it looks like paint by numbers. Remember those? Uh, where you have regions that are this shade and then a slightly lighter shade. No, it has to be continuous. And so you print this and you look at that, you examine that. Here's another one. So from black in the center, gradually reducing the density up to white in the edges. The same thing here. These are all transition type charts. And then you have your blocks. White, this is pure paper. This is pure black, okay? So you're going to print this, and then you use that. Say you're the type of person who only prints monochrome. You never print color. So you have two options. You can use a good ICC profile, and that should give you a good monochrome result. You have to print in RGB mode. In other words, uh, you use the profile. Uh, the printer is going to be using all your inks, including black and grays, to mix together, magically together, composite it together, and give you a full range of uh, neutral tones. Nothing should have a tone. It should be neutral. Whereas if you can take a spectrophotoma photometry uh, reading, it'll say 127, 127, 127. Not 127, you know, 142 and so forth. No, it should be the same numbers, meaning it's the same amount of red, same amount of green, same amount of blue light bouncing back, okay? So this is the monochrome image. Now, I like to mix this with the regular color one, and I, I'll, I'll have like two 5 by 7s on a letter size print, 
That way I can do both at once. That two birds with the same stone, if you will. So let's look at the next one. This is a torture test. We call it a torture test because there is no way. These are out of gamma colors. There is no way in God's green earth your printer is going to be able to produce this. It's unpurposely done that way. And then these are your transitional globes, I call them. They go from saturation to white and from white to black. So red, not well, the, the black one goes from white to black, and then the red goes from full saturation to black, green full saturation to black, and blues the same. These go from full saturation to white. So you use that, and you're looking for banding now. Immediately, I see an issue with my monitor. That's not the way the image looks, folks. You see that? There's no change, and boom, it just suddenly changes. There's no change, and boom, all of a sudden it changes. That's my little $50 monitor right there. Okay? So when you print that, you will be able to then determine whether the printer can produce the full range of tones that those globes have. And then you have just regular images here that you can use to uh, determine your output quality. And then again, some bars, CMYK, red, you know, RGB, CMY and RGB uh, bands from white all the way to saturated. And you can use those again to basically figure out whether your printer can produce a very a very um, gradual um, ramp, if you will, from white, white with a little bit of yellow, more yellow, more yellow, and then few, fully saturated yellow, fully saturated red, green, blue, cyan, and magenta. And again, this is going to have banding. This is going to have posterization because it's on purpose done that way. If you have a printer that can produce a very smooth transition, of these, all of these weird mixes, then you have a good printer, okay? Then you know you have a very good printer, one suited for high-end photography. Same thing here. This is one that will uh, actually show you how much, how sharp a set of details your printer can produce. These are single pixels right here. So if you print this and you take a loop Print it on letter size paper and you take a loop. And if you can determine those three lines, wow, you have a hell of a printer. You probably will not be able to do that on plain paper. It'll probably blend together. But on a glossy paper, you should be able to see that. The same thing here. Just basically use it. They're showing you circles because the lines will have differing angles depending on the position. Everything is dependent on pixels, as you can see. You see the way they look different as the angle changes? The pixels are always going to be in a vertical grid, a vertical and horizontal grid. But, you know, that set of circles, every part of that circle is at a different angle. So it's how does the printer place the dots that it needs to create one of those lines that may be a pixel, one pixel thickness, or two, or four, or six? and so forth. Now look at here. You see some, that's not a very gradual transition. So again, that's my monitor. That does not mean, that does not mean that if I printed from that monitor into say my Pro 1000, that the same effect will be transferred over. No, the monitor is independent to the uh, image being sent to the printer. Notice this block right here. It's like a big blockage. So this is another torture type file. Look at all of these areas here. That's due to my monitor, okay? Then you have your, this is the step number 13 from zero. And all the way up to 255. 255, notice, it's the same as this. Same as the plain paper. 247, there's hardly any difference. 
So you could have something that is like 240, 253, for instance. That's about as white as you can get. It still has a little bit of ink, but it's almost no ink applied. And then all the way down. So this is jumping, oh gosh, what? Um, like every 13, I think, points. So this is yet another one of those torture type files. You can test your printer. This is a color calibration file for your um, like camera, okay? You shoot that. I have that. I have the original one. You shoot that under the same lighting conditions that you're doing your photo shoot, say in location or in your studio, and your then print has to match the original colors of that chart. So your image has to match. These, these patches need to match the original patches of that chart you took a picture of. This is a, a composite of many of the images that are used in common um, test images. You've seen this before, right? Um, you've seen this one before as well. So that's one. I really don't use that one. We'll get to the one that I usually utilize. Here's another one. Again, this whole pack is available for you. Again, another torture type image. And this is the one we use. This is the standard that we have been using for years. Okay. Now, with this one, this row of colors here is completely out of gamut. Your monitor, depending on its quality, will be able to display them, possibly. Maybe not. As you can see, these three greens are supposed to be distinctly different. But this monitor over there cannot deter, you know, determine the difference between. It can barely detect that this one is a little bit different than this one. But these two greens look absolutely the same. That's not the case. They are not the same. Okay, it's just that the monitor can't handle it. That does not mean the printer won't be able to discern the difference. I'll show you. You see that? Those three greens. You can tell the difference between them. That may not match the actual values that are completely out of gamut that this monitor can display, but not this one. So they do that on purpose. The reason they do that is because they're trying to outperform any printer out there that's available. If you underperform, then any mediocre printer can reproduce it. So what's the point? So they have to provide you with colors that are nearly impossible to produce on print, okay? Um, that way you, as we progress, if the ink, the photo printing ink yet world continues to exist, maybe at some point pigments, dyes will be of such amazing quality that they will be able to display some of those colors. But at this point, no. All right. So let me see. Do we have anything else beyond that? I think we may. No, that's the end. So that's the end of that. That's the last one. And that's the one we normally utilize every single time we try to print or test a printer's ability. Okay, hang on. Just me says, should one print perch print with QImage or nozzle check to keep the printer do cleaning cycle? No. Um, it depends. What are you talking about? Are you talking about a Canon printer? Epson printers don't really do, you know, pre-print automatic cleaning cycles just because you didn't print, say, two days. With my Pro 1000, it's literally less than 24 hours. Yeah, so I do that nozzle check every 23 and a half hours or so, uh, as close as I can get. Uh, sometimes I miss and I get a cleaning cycle. Yeah, it happens.
Yeah. No, I will do the clean cycle. So Pro 1000, um, 24 hours. That's it. Now, Pro 10, no, not necessarily. Pro 100, not necessarily either. Um, but the Pro 1000, boy, yeah. Yeah, Pro 1000, every less than a less than a full day. Yeah. You can set Q image to do the purge, the schedule purge uh, print. Uh, just make sure you calibrate the the setup correctly to the colors that are existing in your in your Pro 1000, which is 11 of them. Uh, you tell Q image, I have this color, I have this color, that, and so forth, and then set a schedule and set it to 23, 23 hours, and then just load paper. If you don't print every day, you got to do this to prevent cleaning cycles. Cleaning cycles waste more ink than you actually used to print a photo. You see what I mean? Why would you want to do that? Let's just throw away some money every day. Every day, just take $5 and put it in the toilet and flush it. That's that's what's happening. Okay? That is exactly what's happening. If you're the guy that I think you are, yeah, there was a reason. Um, if you're not, then you're someone else. Okay? We only put up with so much. Los Jokers. Hey, Jose, I buy the QMH from your account. Thank you. Yes. Uh, make sure you use the link that I have on my video descriptions. That'll give you 10% uh, uh, discount. And when they have special discount sales during the year, you'll get a double discount. So, Okay, so let's do something a little bit different. I'm going to back up here. I'm going to open up my Pro, my 80 Pro, my EcoTank 8550. I'm going to top off some of those uh, tanks, okay? So gray, we have about half. So we'll do yellow, photo blue, no, photo black. We'll do photo black first. This is black. That's not the one we want to do. Besides, the bottle would not fit. So we're going to remove the cap. This is the black. This is the pigment black. This is the dye black ink. That's it. And then we'll watch the levels here when it goes up to the top. That means that I either fill the tank up or I ran out of ink. So, and as, as I mentioned last time, look at it, it's going up. Right now it's about here. I received a very high-end set of third-party inks for this printer. And uh, that's it. It is done. I still have a little bit of ink left, so we'll save that. Simple as that. So this is why this is such a great printer. You just add, you saw how easy that was. Let's do cyan. That will be this one here. Then we'll do yellow. And I think we'll do the gray some other time. So I'm also going to top off my uh, photo black my black my pigment black ink i've been using that quite often and then what we'll do is we'll tell the printer that we topped off those so then they'll they'll set the levels up to full again
black. I just need a little bit of that. Been using a lot of that lately since we started printing on the Canon paper, the Canon matte paper. So it's not going to take too much. In this case, I am using Precision Colors inks for the P800, which is a very high density black pigment ink or black matte ink. And if you guys are timing me, you can tell immediately this is really not taking very long. One, two, three, one, two, three. Yellow, yellow. Again, you really cannot make a mistake because the, the cartridges or the bottles are keyed and only allow uh, it to be fitted if it's the right key. So we're here. You can see it just bubbling away inside. So refilling these babies is really about as simple as you can imagine. That's it. We have a little bit of ink left, about this much, right here. You can see. Okay, magenta. We just need a tiny bit of that. And then the gray, I'm going to use my, my new uh, gray ink over here. But that'll be tomorrow. I will do this today. I just wanted to top this off so we can go ahead and do some printing after we are done here topping off. And <laughs> I think that's it. It doesn't really need... Well, look what I did. You got to be careful. Let me get a paper towel. Besides, this one's empty anyway. All right. So... We close that up and we say proceed. Refill the ink up to the upper line. Yes, we did. And we're going to tell which ones we did. One, two, three, four, five. We did not do the gray. But you know what? I'm going to do it tomorrow. So, or maybe this afternoon. So I'll just act like I actually proceeded. To refill all of them and that's it we are done so now i just have to top off this one later on today done The Chroma Optimizer thing. What exactly was that about? Um, you were asking about... Oh, I think who you, I, I know who you are. You were asking about the Chroma Optimizer usage? Yeah, it's used for both. For both uh, glossy as well as matte because it has to. It will use a much smaller amount for black. I mean, for your matte media because... If it didn't, if you only print, say, for instance, on mad media for six months straight, and you you print often, so you never run cleaning cycles, that chrome optimizer channel would be clogged. It has to be kept flowing. So it will use this printer will use some matte black ink as well when I print on glossy paper. It has to to keep everything flowing. I don't know. 
I don't know who you are then. All right, and let's continue on. Are there any compatible products that may actually work on USA and or Canadian new Epson printers? Um, I looked on eBay. I looked for ink for Epson SureColor P9900, uh, P700, P800. The 800 had some uh, compatible inks, but again, those are meant for European or out of North America type models. They have um, different um, firmware installed and they're not locked. Ours are locked. So get that out of your mind. You're not going to be able to use any kind of, com even if they provide you, well, there's an exception. If they provide you with, say, for instance, a chip whose color code, and that's your, that's a unique code, it's like a fingerprint. So we human beings all have individual fingerprints. My index fingers, left and right, are mine. No one else has a fingerprint like mine. And so I am a yellow cartridge and I get installed into the Pro 1000. The Pro 1000 records my fingerprint. And my levels, that's a different programming in that chip. So it sees me as full and I am used, 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 used until I reach empty. And then that chip is supposed to auto reset to full. All I have to do is remove it, remove the cartridge and put it back in. No, it will not work because it still sees the same fingerprint. It remember that's fingerprint. Okay, you're the guy that was talking about your your you forgot to top off your cartridge, is that it? And it saw it as empty, even though the chip was disabled. What do you want to know? I, we talked about that in the beginning of the show. That, yeah, there is a safety net involved. It knows that the internal compartment is not being, is not being refilled any longer, even though you disable the chip, so it declares it as empty at that point. And then it'll stop printing. And all you have to do is basically, if you have not done so, you drill the cartridge, add ink to it above a certain amount, add ink, and then put it back in. That valve that replenishes that internal compartment is still open, waiting. It's waiting for ink to get in. It will allow sufficient amount of ink to fill that compartment. The upper sensor is triggered, closes the valve. Now, even though your chip is empty, disabled, whatever, it will allow you to continue to print. It's as simple as that. I hope that answers what you may have been wondering about. So, yeah. But it's not something I would recommend doing. Okay. Don't rely. Don't rely on the amazing technology built into a Pro 1000. Always stop. If you have disabled all your chips and you're not using any other method to determine when you are low and you should be topping off at that point, top off every month or every two months, all of them. Just don't rely on this type of safety net to keep you in the clear, okay? Just a recommendation. I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to ask. I have a moderator. I, I would have to ask him what. I, I don't really look at, you know, Facebook, like scour it every day. I get too many comments. I let you guys uh, suggest and help you, you know, you all uh, as, as we go through our problems, our needs, and our situations. Okay. 
my if I spend more time doing this, she would move out. Simple as that. And we've been together 53 years. I am not about to uh, take a chance. So I, I look at my Facebook daily, but I have moderators that handle all of the uh, so-called drama. Okay. Be aware of that. Okay, so let me take care of this. Let me open up Photoshop. I want to see if I can do something, a little bit of a demo. And then if we have time, we'll print something. Ah, oh, that's not it. Nope. Ah. Let me just open up directly from the uh Okay, okay. Close down. I got a bunch of stuff unnecessarily opened here. Yeah, close down that. All right, we're good. Let me pop this over here so we can try to do something in, interesting here. I recently, if you guys saw my slideshow that I did, because somebody wanted to know about how did I get to, you know, where I'm at now, like in my childhood, what was my history as far as photography went. Uh, and I did a slideshow. I posted a bunch of pictures uh, during my, you know, early years and in the army and then family and then so on just my whole life and how i got to the point where i'm doing this now uh, on youtube so let's just open up don't be don't give me a hard time please okay so these are some photos here now I basically started off messing around just recently with um, some old photos. Let me see if I can just do at this one. No. Come on. Stop it. This one, this one, this one, and this one. We'll open those up in Photoshop. So this is the actual scan. You can see this is a kind of a texture paper. The original, there's a, there's a nice little crack right there and so on. My dad had a crooked eye, as you can see, and I fixed that using AI. Um, but yeah, well, My mom has a spot right there on her forehead. Anyway, so this was originally, you know, black and white. You can see the edges of the photo there. So I scanned it. There's some scuff marks there. Yeah, just awful. So this is what I ended up with. But... And in AI, I could I could actually move that eye and make it sure, but then that wouldn't be my dad anymore. So, so one of the tools that I mainly use once I create, say, a layer on top of this one, because I don't want to say scan the or try to attempt to fix the original photo. So I'll make a copy of it, as many copies as I need to, or just make layers. So there is a really awesome tool called 
And I let me see if I can see what the hell I'm doing here. It's like a bandage spot healing tool. So you get a circle. This is your brush. And if you enlarge this, you see this streak right here? So if I run it across, if I click and run it across, it's going to maintain those edges of that lighter area, the darker area, that little fine dark line as well. Watch this. I'm going to reduce it. And it's almost magical. Now, I could do this. It's very sh sharp edge on that brush. We're going to reduce the sharpness. So I'm going to undo, undo, and start again. Notice now it's much Sometimes it works perfectly and sometimes it doesn't, but at least you, you can see now the band is almost gone. I could adjust the diameter, make it more selective, like so. So I can copy. You notice if I want to keep, I could crop that out. But if I want to keep it, what I will use is the clone tool. Now I will increase my brush and I'm going to sample something from here i'm going to click alt sample that and then move it and just clone there you go gone there you go gone now the spot he healing tool basically will do that for you sort of magically so i'm going to reduce the size i'm just going to click and it's gone click and it's gone Click and gone. Move the image around a little bit. Click and gone. I already did some previous work on this. So a lot of the things that my mom had that needed to be repaired, I already took care of. And let's see. Now we'll hit my dad's face right here. And boom. And there, now I'm going to clone this because I see a little bit of an error there. So I'm going to reduce the size of my brush. And there you go. I just fixed. Go back to the healing brush. So again, you're getting issues with that that texture of that original really bad bad quality photograph Qual bad quality because it was damaged continue just clicking on areas that need to be fixed if you have something long you can just drag across like that and you can do this as long as you wish, depending on your patience. And you can see that you can pretty much get rid of any sort of mark that does not belong there. So here we have a wide area once again. Now, this might be better to be, you know, done with a clone brush. So we'll just click that. And what I normally do is since this area here is the same density pretty much as this one, it's just here. There seems to be, I think this is just a stain or a streak. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and sample this area here. Then I'm going to reduce the opacity to like half. And I'm just going to 
draw over it. I'm going to take maybe down here. Just follow that line. You see how you can do this just as careful as you can so we don't I'll do here let me see here and then come down and just draw right there so now i eliminated the background you know splotchiness that was there let me see what else has to be done So now the only other thing I would do, let me just get rid of this. For any little spots, you just use this spot healing tool, like so. Now, this corner and this corner is a little bit lighter than it should be. So this is where the dodging and burning in tool comes in. So you can go ahead and set the level so let it just do shadows or mid-tones or highlights and you set up a percentage of how much do you want to really apply you can see it very gradually darkening these areas here i'm just going to do those highlights there see this is way too too bright very uneven this is what you did in the dark room with your basically your hands. Let me do this spot healing tool. Boom. This is some of the most boring work you will ever encounter. <coughs> the type of work that will save. Do I have the right tool picked? I don't think I did. There we go. Enlarge. Oh, there you go. And I think that will do it. So I got rid of all of the junk that was affecting that print. So we go from, oh, I closed it. Sorry. Let me open it again. We go from this to this. Look at that. All of that is gone. And yeah, I could apply a sepia tone if I wish to this, but I think we'll leave it as that. And this can now be printed and it will work, uh, produce a very nice result. It'll still have that, that original um, so-called um, texture that paper had. So, so that is that. Big difference. Here's one that I did uh, recently. It was really, really awful like that. You can see the edges. Oh my gosh. So when you have a tint, or in other words, maybe the original print was sepia tone and you scan it and this area here should be white, but you know you can immediately see that it's not at all white. Um, just decolorize it right away. Turn it into a black and white and then proceed to fix it after that. Now, this can still use some work. I mean, I'm not fully done with it yet. But anyway, that is um, what you can do. And you could take some pretty dramatically really messed up uh, images or prints and scan them, and then just make sure you make a copy of it before you begin to play around, okay? Otherwise, you may do something wrong to the original scan. You'll have to rescan it again, so...
Harold Davis says, I've restored some heavily damaged family photos, but I am not quite compulsive enough to go beyond a few images. Great shots. Hmm. Okay, let me go back to, to you. Um, are you the guy that lives in Florida? If you are not the guy that lives in Florida, then I don't know what happened. Okay? Just letting you know. So let's go ahead and print something. So we have topped off the printer. We're going to go ahead and do a nozzle check before we begin to do anything. And we're going to print one of those um, new images I just got emailed by Harold. Come on. Print the pattern to check the print pen requires cleaning. I'm trying to. It's giving me a hard time here. Maintenance. Nozzle check. Print. Okay, now finally. All right, so let's print that. Oh, the hell happened? I got disconnected. It went to my uh, other little built-in camera which is garbage is everybody back can everybody see me yeah, it seems the video is gone now it should be back all right so can you hear me Good nozzle check, we're good to go. Let's load some paper. And this is the paper that I discovered from Staples. Dual sided. We'll just use the single side this time. So I'm going to open up QImage. I think we're going to be done. No longer need this. So QImage. I don't know why it keeps getting muted, automatically muting itself. Today's not my day. All right, let's open up QImage. Let me locate the new photos from Harold. Desktop. Click Harold Davies. Let's 
So this is a good one here. Let me show you that. Right here. This I, I just got this one from him. We'll go ahead and print that. So what we we'll have to do is we got to recall the settings that I use for that particular paper. Okay. So to do so, I already have it saved. Click on the date. We're looking for Canon uh, Matte. Here we go. Epson EcoTank 8550 Canon Photo Matte. So what that's going to do is going to load the same size image, same size paper, I mean. And why don't we, uh, I was going to do two of them together. Yeah, why not? So we'll load this one. And then we'll load, what else did I get today? Mm, this one here. So we'll just load those two. We'll see how they print. It should be, it should be fantastic. So we're not going to do any kind of adjustment. Maybe I'll move this up a little bit. And you can do that. Did you notice what I just did? I'm going to add a bit of sharpness. Output sharpening, that is. Boom, look at that. It immediately sharpens it without any artifacts. Same thing with this one. Radius of 2, amount 100. We'll move this. A little bit this way. Boom. Now everything is sort of centered. And we'll print it. That's it. It's going to go ahead and load. And once it's loaded, it will go ding dong. And then we can come back and uh, check it out. Should be perfectly fine. Then once once that is done, I have other paper loaded, so maybe we'll do uh, one full one. Seventy five percent, eighty nine, ninety five, one hundred. Okay, that's printing now. Minimize that. Right click, remove all. We'll do full. So for full, I'm going to go ahead and set up a border. Specify one dimension or border. Number three choice. And we'll type in 0.5. Half inch border all around. And let's see what we have here. I think this one came in today. Hmm. There, but that's being cropped. So we're going to go ahead and choose not to crop it. Select, turn that off, double click. That's already very sharp. I don't need to sharpen it anymore. So we're going to get out and print it. Boom. Now, this is automatically set to the correct ICC profile, the one that I created for that paper combination, which happens to be perfectly also for the paper from Staples, the matte paper from Staples, that we are using the dual-sided paper. Okay. 
Here's the desert shot. And then here we have the, I don't know exactly where that is. I know he told me on the email. But again, these all of these images will be available uh, for you to purchase prints on. I'm making prints for myself and also for him as a gift, which he already gave me some payment for anyway. I didn't really want payment, but, you know, I appreciate that. That helps the channel out. All right, so let's go ahead and let me see. What are we going to do here? I don't know what was causing the um, audio and video to just leave it happened once before and that was really annoying <laughs> that is so quick and we're looking for many folks have complained about like marks from rollers and that type of thing, maybe transfer mechanisms, uh, travel mechanisms, paper feed. Um, but again, I don't see anything in as we did last time when we printed on the other side. Let's let's print something on the other side. So this was in this orientation, I believe. I shouldn't have done that, but we're just going to go ahead and rotate it and print. We'll see what happens because you really should have that print dry fully. Before you attempt to print on the opposite uh, side, if it's a double, a dual coated type media, you need to be really careful. Let me see, this is the one. What did we just do? Okay. We've done this one before. We did that on uh, a smaller. I think I did that last week. Let's go ahead and print that one just to see if we get any roller marks. This is the, this is the real test. Oh, sorry. There we go. This is the real test to find out uh, if, you, if your transport system is causing any kind of marks. And you may not see them on the printed side, but possibly on the back. So now that we printed on both on one side, we're going to flip it over and see if there's going to be any issues with the back side. So. There we go. And cross fingers. We're going to go ahead and set this for 5 by 7 again. I'm going to remove that one. We'll do something else. Hmm. Did we do that one? No. Let's do this one. And, or did we? No, we didn't. Now I don't remember which one. Oh, here's the black and white version of that photo. We'll do both of them. There is one little issue here. Let me go ahead and print that. Notice we're just loading, loading them and printing. You see that little, I don't know if you can see a little kink right here. There you go. You should be able to see that. So that happened when I flipped it over. So it seems that Maybe he just got caught in there. So 
something almost unnoticeable, but it's there. But as far as any kind of roller marks or any kind of artifacts, any you know blotches or, or transferring of ink that the rollers picked up on, it's just not there. So, you know, there's been a lot of complaints about this particular model printing leaving marks, and I have yet to experience that. So maybe I'm just lucky. Who knows? This one will soon be out. So again, we're just going ahead and print, printing. Once you get the settings that work, and we found out last week that this printer works perfectly well with that weird paper, dual-sided paper from Staples. And I'm using the same settings I was using for the Canon Pro, whatever it's called, matte paper, custom profile for the Canon paper, which seems to be working perfectly. Lucky? Maybe. Maybe we're just lucky. Pretty neat. And I'm looking at this under my lighting. Yeah, that is neutral. Beautiful. Gorgeous tonality. And beautiful, uh, you know, full range of tones. Very well edited, I have to ask. I have to say. Now, last week I showed you. This is a staple eighty under 8550. This is Canon on the 8550. So this combination seems to be working just fine. Now, if I did a custom profile for that staple paper, maybe it'll squeeze out the last little drop of quality. And uh, yeah, that would be another perfect combination for this printer now i mean you know weird you're supposed to use epson paper in this case it's presentation mat so whatever things don't always have to be done you know exactly the way that they're supposed to be done okay you can you can pretty much got you know can get away with with some things sometimes okay let's do one more we're gonna go ahead and do that border again and uh, we'll remove this and uh, let's see we have some of our photos here I like this one because it's edited in a HDR type mode. We'll print that one. No, I don't want to print that one unless I crop that silly uh, border. I used to do that all the time. Let me make sure that I don't have those white strokes around it. And now we can go ahead and print that and uh, see what we get. It's already been sharpened, so it doesn't have any other uh, issues that have to be dealt with. Again, this is a weird HDR type effect, but it should, it should look really good on matte paper. See how easy it is? Really, once you, once you arrive at a situation where you do your standard print, standard image and it's as good as you could imagine it being uh save those settings and in q image you just simply go to this folder here right there click on that oh it's it's loading right now i can't do that once it is done queuing up i'll be able to do that okay here we go so get out of the way click on that and just give it a name 
make up a name for those particular set of, you know, sets of settings and save it. And then you can be able, you know, you can come back and recall it the next time you use that same paper combination. You should be all set. That's what we're doing here. We're using the same proven combination of settings for that particular paper, that ICC profile, that printer. And I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to even think about it. And it's given me results that match my monitor. Isn't that what the goal is? Right. Do you have a recommended troubleshooting guide for Canon printers? I've been following the official utility instructions, trying to fix my use, fix my Pro 100, and I've run into a wall. What are you trying to fix? This originally, um, yeah, so they're not very helpful, okay? It's clean cycle or send it to the shop. So what are you what are you dealing with at this moment that you may need help on? You can just ask right here, and if we can help, if I can help you, I will sort of lead you along. But no, there are there's not really a booklet that you can buy or a PDF you can download. You just deal with forums and ask people questions, and hopefully they give you the correct answer. What what specifically are you dealing with right now? There we go. Perfect. I, I have no issues with this. Gorgeous. Isn't that unusual? So, and I, I gave it that weird look with a plugin that did not require like multiple exposures, like correct exposure, one stop under, one stop over, and then blend it together into an HDR. It just applied that look automatically. I don't know how it does it, but it's, it's neat and nice um, old you know, train car completely covered with graffiti and rusty tracks. So please go ahead and, 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 and let's talk about what you would like to discuss, Nicholas. If it's just something in general, like if you need you know, a, a a way to find out how to deal with multiple types of issues. I don't know of anything that's available out there because especially not from Canon or not from Epson. Um, they, again, it's like looking up error codes. The fixes are all very vague and almost ridiculous. Restart your printer, you know, uh, sure. <laughs> but that doesn't really fix the issue. Okay, I was able to successfully print some images. Do it looked though it looked like excess ink had pooled, and then created a streak on the image after it came out of the paper, the printer. So, what I'm going to ask you first is, what paper did you print on? Okay, um, especially if you are not using Canon paper. So, usually, what will happen? Say, for instance that paper the other print that you saw that said canon that was printed on canon uh, this this stuff right here okay now on a canon printer there is a setting for that paper and it determines the thickness of the paper so how much gap between the print heads nozzle plate and the paper surface there is an an optimal gap that is determined by how far away from the surface of the paper the ink drops are sprayed that has to be maintained and the way it maintains that because different papers have different thicknesses is through that media configuration they have done that for us but when i use some other matte paper it could be thick. It could be a paper that that uh, will become wet looking in the deep shadows 
because the ink density required by the original paper is much higher than the ink density required by this different brand matte paper. But they tell me to use that particular paper choice, you see? So there's a discrepancy. Um, if, if you, I assume that the so-called ink pooling occurs in the darker areas. Now, if you are using a paper that's completely incompatible, it will produce what's called puddling. Well, you li literally will see droplets. It's like if you had an oily surface of anything and you applied, say, spray some water, you will see water drops. It will not be smooth. It'll just be water drops because the paper surface actually repels the ink. It was Canon paper. I also, I also did not set a specific profile. Profile has nothing to do with that. Profile is about color rendition. Okay. The profile doesn't has nothing to do with the physical requirements or characteristics of the paper. The media configuration, in other words, the name that you see on your on your menu, that's what determines whether the correct settings, gap amount, density, okay? And it can be linked to a profile, but really the profile is all about color rendition, not about the physical characteristics. So, so you know, you may be using the term incorrectly. Profile is not the paper choice, okay? That is the media configuration. So it was not can of, can of paper, so there you go. Yeah. So, you, you, again, like I said, it nothing to do with the profile. Um, the, although, well, in this case, if you chose the recommended paper choice, that paper said to use, what kind of paper was it? Please tell me what it is. And we, we don't have to go through this whole, you know, um, talking for half an hour. And maybe that's not the reason. Tell me the paper. Tell me where you got it from. And then I could, oh, that, you know, now I know why. Uh, some papers will be completely incompatible. I have some of those. And uh, they have what they call, it's a gelatin surface instead of the, a modern type uh, coating. So if you can quickly just tell me that, I will. Yeah. Let me see what paper it was. Yeah, qu quickly tell me because we got to go. I got warned last week that I was nearing my limit on broadcast hours. There you go. That's your answer. Yeah. It's probably what they call, it's probably what they call um, swellable surface papers. And they were used for printers 15 years ago. Okay. Not today. So if you see, if you see puddling, that's what it is. Okay. Just choose a different paper, a modern paper a Canon paper or something from a manufacturer that is meant, it specifically says it will work on a Pro 10, okay? We'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, everyone. We're going to go ahead and uh, get ready to go off before um, StreamYard starts harassing me again. We'll load the see you next week print or image. So again, I hope, um, yeah, I hope um, that person uh, did not get too offended. I don't know what happened, um, but hey, if the moderators thought that there was some controversial stuff going on, um, they will sack you. And I specifically assigned these jobs, these positions to certain people that I rely on. And so... Um, you know, I was getting tons, tons of spam and sexual stuff and pornography and okay. And again, keep your comments to a specific, you know, um, subject. Um, if it sounds like you're, well, I don't know what the reasons were because I really don't know. But if it's the person that I thought it was, uh, should have been okay.
But if there was a comment in there or you commented after that person that got possibly removed, uh, then your post gets removed too. Anything that, that's on the same uh, thread just gets removed. All right. Again, I apologize if anyone got offended, but that's the way things are run on Facebook. In fact, they're a lot more stricter than I am. All right. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and like. We will see you the next time. Let's go ahead and load a new slideshow, and then we'll see you back here again next week. Bye-bye, everybody. So long.